Hello and welcome to the episode 20 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today, we're focusing on the events of the 20th of January. Some highlights will include the usual live performances, a wedding proposal, some recording sessions, and a dramatic haircut. In 1961, Stuart Sutcliffe leaves Hamburg, Germany, to go back to Liverpool. He had tonsillitis, and so Astrid Kircher, his girlfriend, bought him a plane ticket for the journey. Quite a luxury compared to the usual boat and train arrangement. On the same day, at night, the Beatles, featuring Pete Best on drums, performed at the Latham Hall in Liverpool. On the 20th of January 1962, the Beatles, with Pete Best still on drums, performed an evening concert at the Cavern Club in Liverpool. Same story 1963, with another nighttime engagement at the Cavern Club. The Beatles, now with Ringo Starr, shared the stage with Pete Hartigan's Jasmine, the Denisons, the Mercy Beats, and the Swinging Blue Jeans. The day saw the return of Neil Aspinall on road manager's duty. Aspinall was still feverish and explained to manager Brian Epstein that he would have been unable to drive the band to London for their engagement to record an appearance on the Friday Spectacular radio show on the 21st, which we will cover in the next episode. Epstein bumped into Marl Evans, bouncer at the cavern, and asked him to cover for Aspinall. Evans accepted, and soon he started to work for the Beatles, leaving his other employments. In 1964, the Beatles performed again at the Olympia Theatre in Paris, France. Earlier in the day, French radio Europe On aired an interview with the lads, probably between 12 noon and 12.30 pm. On the 20th of January 1965, Ringo Starr proposed to his girlfriend Maureen Cox, and she accepted. The event took place at the Adlib Club, which for a time was the Beatles' favorite nightclub, where they had a private table and rubbed elbows with other VIPs of the swinging London. In 1967, between 7 pm and 1.10 am, the Beatles kept working on a day in the life. The first completed task was the reduction of the previous day worth of recordings onto take six. Then, the band recorded further overdubs, a vocal track by John Lennon, Paul McCartney's bass line and a song introduction on clavichord, and Ringo Starr's drum track. The session also outlined why this song has been showed off by critics as a typical example of how the Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership had evolved by 1967. One of them had the idea for a song and its initial development. He then showed what he had to the partner for completion or to round off any rough edge. In this case, John had come up with the beginning and the end of the song, only for Paul to supply its middle section. Paul's bit was not composed specifically for a day in the life, but the two had become so accustomed to work together that it was as if the two pieces had meant to be put together from the start. Paul's first line in the middle section, woke up fell out of bed, even managed to make good use of the sound of the alarm clock marking the end of the bridge leading to the section, recorded on the previous day. On the 20th of January 1969, the Beatles reconvened at the Apple Course studio to start recording their new album, Get Back. It was only a test session to check on the work done on the basement studio by Apple Electronics head Alexis Mardas. Mardas had promised all sorts of wonders to the Beatles. An unheard of 72 track recording machine at a time when only a handful of studios around the globe had access to 16-track machines. Invisible sonic force fields that would help keeping the sound of different instruments directed to some microphones and off others, making existing studio sound baffles outdated. A system of dozens of micro speakers to achieve a new super stereo sound, and so on. 
Unfortunately, though, when the band tried out the facilities today with a sample recording, the result proved to be totally unusable. George Martin had to ask EMI for the temporary loan of two four-track consoles to touch them to Apple's 8-track recorder. The time needed to make the studios usable meant that 48 hours were lost before the work could begin in full. Mardas, later on, excused his work, claiming that the equipment was still in a prototype stage, but Alan Parsons, Glyn Jones and Jeff Emmerich are all on record in the complete Beatles recording sessions with rather harsh comments on the recording console and the rest of the equipment, which ended up being sold as scrap material to a second-hand electronics shop. Finally, on this date in 1970, John Lennon and Yoko Ono decided to have their hair cut really short. The couple was still in Denmark to be with Ono's daughter, Kyoto, and while the reasons for the shaving is unclear, it is probable that the two were just looking for another way to make headlines again and have another chance to talk about their ongoing campaign for peace. They were successful. The Daily Mirror described the haircuts as the most sensational scalpings since the Red Indians went out of business. It was the shortest haircut that Lennon had displayed since his early teens. This concludes today's episode of What A Fab Day. Remember to please check www.simonmas.com support to find ways to support this podcast and my other music-related projects, and to use the link in the description to check out a complete bibliography of the podcast with the relative Amazon affiliate links. Also remember that some episodes are being recorded with extra bits that are not available to the general public. I will keep you posted on how to acquire such a deluxe version as soon as I can. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.